हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम बैक टू श्री शकांक्षा ब्लॉग्स आई होप यू ऑल आर डूइंग एब्सोल्यूटली फाइन तो गाइज आज है संडे एंड हम लोग जा रहे हैं एक जगह एंड वो मैं आपको रास्ते में बताती हूँ हम कहाँ जा रहे हैं बट बहुत ही अमेजिंग जगह है एंड हिस्ट्री से रिलेटेड है तो अगर आप लोगों को हिस्ट्री में इंटरेस्ट हो तो आपके लिए ये परफेक्ट वीडियो है तो एंड तक देखिए ये वीडियो एंड अभी मैं आपको फिर बताऊँगी कि हम कहाँ जा रहे हैं तो चलते हैं कार में एंड फिर बात करते हैं सो गाइज टाइम हो रहा है दोपहर के 12:30 थर्टी हम लोगों ने लंच कर लिया है एंड अब हम लोग निकले हैं यहाँ से एंड डेनवर से 30 मिनट्स दूर ही है वो प्लेस तो हम लोग 30 मिनट्स में वहाँ पहुँच जाएंगे एंड शरीश ने पूरा क्लीन शेव कर लिया है तो आपको पहचान में नहीं आ रहा होगा बट हेलो मैं नया हूँ ब्लॉग में <laughs> तो तो पहले मैं आपको बता देती हूँ कि हम लोग जा कहाँ रहे हैं तो बेसिकली हम जा रहे हैं डायनासोर रिच जो कि एक नेशनल नेचुरल लैंडमार्क है डायनासोर का एंड ना सिर्फ यूएस में बल्कि पूरे वर्ल्ड में ये टॉप लैंडमार्क्स में आता है जहाँ पे बहुत सारी डिस्कवरीज हुई है एंड बहुत सारे ऐसे ट्रेड्स मिले हैं कि डायनासोर एग्जिस्ट करते थे एंड अलग अलग फॉसिल्स मिले एंड बहुत सारे वहाँ पे रिसर्च हो हो रहे हैं काफ़ी टाइम से एंड अभी भी हो रहे होते आ रहे हैं एंड अगर मैं वेदर की बात करूँ तो आज का वेदर काफ़ी अच्छा है ठंड बिल्कुल भी नहीं है मतलब तो अभी कितना टेम्परेचर है ट्वेंटी थ्री डिग्री नहीं नहीं ये कार का टेम्परेचर अच्छा। है <laughs> अभी जीरो या वन ऐसे कुछ है बस धूप हुई है हाँ मतलब आज बिल्कुल भी ठंड नहीं लग रही है एंड बट हम जहाँ जा रहे हैं ना वहाँ वहाँ पे ठंड हो पहाड़ है थोड़ा तो हमने जैकेट्स वगैरह तो पहन लिए हैं एंड पीछे भी और जैकेट्स रखे हैं तो लेट्स सी वहाँ कैसा होता है एंड अभी मैं आपको दिखाती हूँ कि काफ़ी अच्छा वेदर है यहाँ पे स्काई भी काफ़ी क्लियर है एंड सनी है ये आप देख सकते हैं यहाँ पे एक डायनासोर रिच का बोर्ड लगा हुआ है ये रहा एंड यहाँ पे भी लिखा है डायनासोर रिच यहाँ पे काफ़ी सारे डायनासोर्स बने हुए हैं मैं भी बाहर उतर के आपको दिखाऊंगी बट एंड पार्किंग भी है ये सारी वहाँ पे शायद गिफ्ट शॉप वगैरह होगा और आई थिंक टिकट भी लेना होगा ना हाँ अगर वाला टूर कर रहे हैं यहाँ पे एक डायनासोर है आई थिंक बच्चों के लिए बहुत फैसिनेटिंग होगा हाँ उनके लिए तो मुझे तो बहुत ही मजा आता है ये सब डायनासोर एलियन इनके बारे में पता करने में चलो तो पार्किंग में लगा दी हमने गाड़ी आगे? हाँ चले चले ठंडी बात हाँ देखते हैं बाहर कैसा वेदर है उतर के पता टोपी पहनेंगे टोपी मास्क पहनना है पहले तो मास्क इज वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट वेदर तो अच्छा है ठंड नहीं है ज्यादा ठीक है। हम लोगों ने अपने जैकेट्स वगैरह पहन लिए है इवन दो अभी इतनी ठंडी नहीं है बट ऊपर जैसे जैसे हम ट्रेल पे जाएंगे तो हमें हो सकता है ठंडी लगे तो हमने अपने जैकेट्स वगैरह पहन लिए है एंड अब यहाँ पे चलते हैं और पता करते हैं कि टिकट्स का क्या सीन है कैसे टूर होते हैं शायद बस टूर होता है एंड यहाँ पे बहुत सारे टूर्स होते हैं विथ जियोलॉजिस्ट तो वो आपको सारे डिटेल्स में बताएंगे पर अभी कोविड की वजह से पता नहीं वो वाले टूर्स हो रहे हैं कि नहीं तो चलते हैं और पता करते हैं टिकट्स एंड इन्फॉर्मेशन चलो अंदर देखते हैं फिर
वन टिकट्स ले लिए हैं बस टूर में हम लोग जाएंगे एंड थर्टी डॉलर्स लगे हम दो लोगों के तो फिफ्टीन डॉलर पर हेड एंड उस टूर पे हमारे साथ गाइड भी होगा जो हमें सारी इम्पॉर्टेंट प्लेसेस पे लेके जाएगा तो काफ़ी मज़ा आने वाला है एंड टूर अभी थर्टी फाइव मिनट्स में है तो तब तक हम यहीं पे थोड़ा एक्सप्लोर कर रहे हैं एंड ये गिफ्ट शॉप है जहाँ पे हम आए हैं देखने की क्या क्या चीज़ें हैं तो तो यहाँ पे ये सारे डायनासोर्स हैं बच्चों के लिए एंड काफ़ी अच्छा है ये हाथी क्या कर रहा है यहाँ पे ये वो मिडिवल पीरियड वाला एलिफेंट है मेमथ बोलते हैं हैं अच्छा ये भी है ना ये देख ये सारे अलग अलग स्पीशीज के डायनासोर्स के ये है टूर का मैप भी ले लेंगे हम लोग हाँ। उधर रखा हुआ था तो टूर का मैप ले लेते हैं वॉलेंटियर दो ले लें थैंक यू तो आ, हमारी टूर तो अभी स्टार्ट होने वाली है बट मैं हम लोग ट्राई करेंगे कि ये टूर में आपको एक एक चीज़ दिखाए एंड एक एक चीज़ कवर करें अपने वीडियो में जो हम देख रहे हैं या हम जान रहे हैं क्योंकि ये बहुत ही फैसिनेटिंग होने वाला है एंड मैं तो काफ़ी एक्साइटेड हूँ देखने के लिए क्योंकि मैंने अपनी लाइफ में ऐसे कोई भी साइट कभी विज़िट नहीं की है जहाँ पर एक्चुअल डायनासोर के ट्रेसेस मिल रहे हों तो हम लोग ने टिकट्स ले लिए हैं एंड अब जब हम टूर स्टार्ट करेंगे तो हम एक एक चीज़ उसमें कवर करेंगे तो अगर आपको फास्ट फॉरवर्ड में देखना हो या फिर वो भी कर सकते हैं या तो आप एंड में मैं समरी दूंगी पूरे टूर के बारे में तो आप वो भी देख सकते हैं तो या चलो स्टार्ट करते हैं टूर काफ़ी मज़ा आने वाला है सो so गाइज़ हमारा टूर स्टार्ट होने में तो अभी 15-20 मिनट्स है तो उसके पहले मैंने सोचा कि मैं आपको थोड़ी यहाँ की हिस्ट्री बता देती हूँ तो बेसिकली 1877 में कोलोराडो स्कूल ऑफ माइंस के एक प्रोफेसर आर्थर लेक्स थे जिन्होंने यहाँ पे बहुत सारे फॉसिल्स और डायनासोर के ट्रेड्स ढूँढे थे एंड फिर उसके बाद से यहाँ पर बहुत सारे रिसर्च हुए बहुत सारे पेलियंटोलॉजिस्ट यहाँ पर रिसर्च करे एंड फिर उन्होंने बहुत सारी चीज़ें पता करी तो वो सारी साइट्स पे हमें लेके जाएंगे इस टूर पर तो यहाँ मैप्स में बताया है कि जैसे ये डायनासोर ट्रैक साइट है उसके अलावा यहाँ पे बहुत सारे फॉसिल्स भी मिले हैं तो वो भी अभी बताएंगे टूर पे डिटेल में पता चलेगा जितना मुझे गूगल पे मिला वो मैं आपको बता रही हूँ एंड या पता चलेगा आगे कि और क्या क्या यहाँ पे रिसर्चेस हुई हैं एंड कौन कौन से टाइप्स के डायनासोर मिले हैं तो वो सब आगे देखेंगे एंड यहाँ पे मेरे पीछे जो डायनासोर है उस पर मास्क लगा हुआ है तो नया टाइप का डायनासोर तो काफ़ी फनी है इसने अपने लाइफ में सोचा नहीं होगा कि मास्क में इनको घूमना पड़ेगा तो आप समझ रहे हैं ना ये भी सेफ नहीं है भाई से पूछता हूँ भाई वैक्सीन वैक्सीन लगवाई कि नहीं मोदी जी फ्री में वैक्सीन बांट रहे हैं जाओ उधर लगवा लो बोलना पड़ता है ना भाई इनको पता कैसे चलेगा अच्छा फ्री में वैक्सीन बांट रहे भाई मोदी जी यहाँ पे भी फ्री में हो रही है ना हाँ खैर यहाँ पे भी हो रही है मेरे पीछे बस देख सकते है ये हमें लेके जाएगी सारे पॉइंट पे जो की इस मैप में दिए हुए है एंड हम लोगों ने बैग में अपना बॉटल और सैनिटाइजर सब कुछ रख लिया है जैकेट वगैरह पहन ली है तो यार देखते हैं कि कैसा होने वाला है मैं तो बहुत ही एक्साइटेड हूँ एक आधो डायनासोर तो घर लेके जाएंगे <laughs> मिल गया तो अच्छा
ये डायनासोर ने भी मास्क लगाया बट पता है बेसिकली डायनासोर्स भी कुछ हार्बी होते थे एंड कुछ कार्नी कुछ ओमनी जैसे अभी के एनिमल्स होते हैं मतलब वो दिखने में इतना ह्यूज एनिमल है बट कुछ डायनासोर ऐसे थे जो इतने ह्यूज होने के बाद भी सिर्फ प्लांट्स ही और घास खाते थे <laughs> क्या पढ़ रहे तो यहाँ पे ना ऐसा लिखा है कि यहाँ पे मेगा ट्रैक साइट्स है जहाँ पे बहुत लार्ज वॉल्यूम में डायनासोर्स वॉक करते थे दीज एक्सटेंसिव ट्रैक साइट्स वर फर्स्ट डिस्कवर्ड इन द साइंटिफिक लिटरेचर इन 1988। तो इसमें लिखा है कि मेगा ट्रैक साइट्स आर लार्ज जियोग्राफिक एरियाज दैट कंटेन सिमिलर डायनासोर ट्रैक्स इन अ पर्टिकुलर लेयर ऑफ रॉक्स तो ये ऐसा ये एक पूरा ट्रैक है एंड यहाँ पे ऐसे ऐसे बहुत सारे फुटप्रिंट्स मिले मिले थे हाँ हमें भी लेके जाएंगे हाँ फिर आगे ये वाला देखते हैं इसमें लिखा है द फर्स्ट रिकॉर्डेड डिस्कवरी ऑफ डायनासोर ट्रैक्स वाज इन 1802 व्हेन अ मैसाचुसेट्स फार्मर नेम्ड Pliny Moody plowed up a rock with dinosaur tracks. He believed that they were giant bird tracks. A reasonable guess. मतलब उसको लगा birds का track है. But बाद में जब research हुई तो पता चला कि वो dinosaur के tracks थे. Dinosaur fossil bones भी मिली हैं यहाँ पे. ये जो मैं आपको बता रही थी ना 1870s में Arthur Lakes करके जो university के professors थे इन्हें फॉसिल बोन्स मिले एपेटासोरस टिकेसोरस एंड एलोसोरस के एंड ये 150 मिलियन इयर्स ओल्ड है ये एपेटासोरस एलोसोरस टिगोसोरस ये जो स्टिगोसोरस थे ये प्लांट ईटर्स थे ओ शाकाहारी डायनासोर हाँ। और ये जो एपेटोसोरस था ये सेवेंटी फीट लॉन्ग एंड थर्टी थ्री टन का होता था ये वाला हाँ एंड ये वाला फोर्टी फीट लॉन्ग और मीट ईटर होता था एलोसोरस बाप रे हाँ वॉट काइंड ऑफ बोन्स आर यू बिफोर बोन्स आर बिफोर यू ये ये इसकी बोन है इसके अंदर है ये देख ये मार्क्स इसके अंदर दबी हुई है ये देख द सैंडस्टोन ब्लॉक कंटेन सिक्स फर्सिलाइज वर्टिब्रे ऑफ एन फाउंड नॉर्थ ऑफ फोर्ट कोले डायनासोर रेज वॉज द साइट ऑफ द फर्स्ट एलोसोरस डिस्कवरी इन 1877 ओ इसके अंदर मिला है मतलब हाँ उसके बैक बोन बैक बोन मिली है। इसमें से निकल गया तो मजा आ जाएगा। मजा आ जाएगा। <laughs> ये जो है, ये ये जो है, है और यहाँ पे जहाँ पे हम खड़े हैं, यहाँ पे 150 मिलियन इयर्स है गो ये यहाँ पे ऐसे घूम रहा था आ। और तब ये पूरा जो एरिया था ये पूरा फ्लैट था और इसका जो स्मॉल हेड है ना इससे वो ग्राउंड के क्लोज रहता था तो खाने पीने का मिलता था
चलते हैं टूर पे चले चलो छोटे छोटे बच्चे भी जा रहे हैं from local denver you guys are local okay well great i'm glad you guys were able to make it down today and so with that we will go ahead and get started all right so today we're going to kind of talk a little bit about how dinosaurs lived because we can tell a lot about their behaviors based on the fossils that we find here at the ridge And the first dinosaur that I am going to introduce to you is this big brown stripy dinosaur. That guy is called the Iguanodon. Keep that in mind because I'll be asking you again when we get to our first site. I also want you to pay attention to the Iguanodon's feet. You'll notice that his front foot kind of looks like a hoof and his back foot has three toes. All right, we are approaching a second dinosaur here. Do you guys happen to know the name of this dinosaur? Stegosaurus. 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 Yeah, this is the Stegosaurus. And we love the Stegosaurus here at Dinosaur Ridge because we actually found the very first one in the world here in 1877. Um, so because of that, it is a Colorado State dinosaur and fossil. Um, and when they first discovered the Stegosaurus, they thought that those big fins or plates on its back actually laid flat, kind of like a turtle shell, and that's what gave it its name. So Stegosaurus is Latin for roofed lizard. Uh, by the time the scientists realized that those plates actually sit upright, like how you see on our statue, it was a little too late to change the name, but that is okay. Um, and modern scientists actually believe that those plates are used for thermal regulation. and kind of act like solar panels to help keep this dinosaur warm. 
And then the last thing um, about this dinosaur, what do you notice about its head relative to its body? It's tiny. It's small. It's pretty little, huh? Um, so usually when you have an itty bitty head, what else is itty bitty? Your brain. Exactly, your brain, right? <laughs> Um, if you had to guess how big the Stegosaurus's brain is based on our statue here, how big do you think it is? Probably that big. Yeah, that's exactly right. This big, about the size of a walnut. Oh. Yeah, pretty itty bitty. So, unfortunately, our friend the Stegosaurus was not blessed with superior intelligence. However, uh, he perhaps had an excellent personality. And sometimes that's all that matters, right? Yeah. The other thing you may have noticed about the Stegosaurus is there are spikes or spear looking things on his tail. And yeah, they were used to protect himself. And they have a really goofy name. Do you guys know what they're called? No. <laughs> that's all good because I'm going to tell you. So they're called the Thagomizers. That's with a TH. Um, and we get that really goofy name from a guy named Gary Larson. Gary Larson was a famous cartoonist, uh, known for his far side comics. And in one of his comics, he has some cavemen sitting around, and one of them declares that the spikes on a Stegosaurus's tail are thagomizers, um, after their late friend Doug Simmons ran into the nasty end of one of those. And scientists had the name, didn't have a name for those things, because I just said the time. Uh, but they saw the comic and thought that the comic was really funny. So they just decided to keep it. Uh, so moral of that story is if you're funny enough and clever enough and scientists just don't have any other options, they'll use your funny words to describe dinosaurs or parts of dinosaurs. Now the Stegosaurus was a Jurassic dinosaur, um, but we're going to... Uh, kind of transition into our mm -hmm. Cretaceous age dinosaurs. Um, so the Cretaceous uh, is a time period between 100 million years ago and 65 million years ago. This is the last era of dinosaurs. They are the closest to us in geologic time. And to understand how these dinosaurs were living, we have to first understand what types of environments they were living in. And uh, we can tell that based on the geology that we find their fossils in. And so we're going to focus on the rocks on this hillside here to the right. Um, does anyone know what type of rock this is or the name of this rock? Mica. Mica? It's not quite mica. So mica is a mineral and mica is in this rock, but it's not the rock itself. Any other guesses? Pretty flat rock. Sandstone? It is pretty flat. It's not quite a sandstone, but it is a type of sedimentary rock. Flatstone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's almost a flat stone. Okay? So this is a shale. Um, and so this shale is known as the Benton Shale Formation, and it correlates to when the Western Interior Seaway came through Colorado 100 million years ago. And all of this shale was once the ooey gooey muddy seafloor of this western interior sea seaway. And so this western interior seaway is exactly what it sounds like. It's a seaway that came through the middle of the United States. So it's kind of hard to believe, but most of Colorado, um, including up to Wyoming and Montana and as far east as even Missouri, all of that was underwater 100 million years ago. And this shale is the evidence of that. Um, because it was the ooey gooey muddy seafloor, it means that we get marine fossils in here. Things like fish scales and bits of fish skeleton, marine plants, um, and sometimes in rare cases, marine reptiles like Mosasaur and Plesiosaur. Where is this so easy to break? Um, part of it has to do with the fact that there is mica in them, and mica is a very platy mineral. And um, when the mica minerals orient themselves in this rock, it causes the rock to fracture in plates, and it's very brittle. All right, so we're going to start to see our uh, shale is transitioning into a more red orange looking rock. Ooh, ooh. This is actually the Dakota sandstone. And here in Colorado, we were actually along a tidal plain or a tidal flat, so we had a lot of beaches here. And if you want to picture us on something like the magic school bus coming up out of the water and onto the beach, that's exactly what we just did. 
You'll notice that the sandstone has ripples in it. These ripples are symmetrical, meaning they look like this, and you can only get that from waves rolling on and off the shoreline. Sometimes in geology, we see ripples that are asymmetrical, meaning they look like this, and that would indicate a river type environment. So aside from the geology, that's another clue that tells us this was a beach rather than any other type of water environment. Other clues that tell us this was a beach include things like our trace fossils, which are the fossils left behind by animals that indicate some sort of behavior. Things like burrows from clams, snails, worms, and other various critters that buried themselves underneath the sand on the beach. The sandstone also tells us a lot about what the climate was like here 100 million years ago because we get mangrove root impressions. And these mangroves are trees that grow in warm, swampy, tropical climates. Think of places like modern day Florida or Louisiana. And those are ones growing here in Colorado. Um, so that's gonna bring us into our beach that our dinosaurs walked in. And I kind of set the tone. Everything to the east of us is underwater during this time. This beach is very hot, very humid. It's muddy, slimy, and kind of smelly. And we're going to talk a little bit about our dinosaur tracks now. Okay, so this is our dinosaur track site. There are close to 300 different dinosaur tracks here from three different dinosaurs and one lonely crocodile. I was originally discovered in the 1930s. Um, so considering how well preserved these dinosaur tracks are, um, this is why it's the number one dinosaur track site <laughs> in the United States. Um, in the 1930s, when they originally discovered these dinosaur tracks, they discovered it by blowing up this hillside because they wanted to build an access road to Red Rocks, which is just on the other side here. Um, and as they were blowing this hillside up, they realized that there are dinosaur tracks in here. So rather than continue to blow it up, they actually decided to preserve it for future generations. So we can kind of thank those guys in spirit for doing that for us. Kind of going back into our dinosaurs, uh, what was the name of that very first dinosaur we saw? Yeah. Yeah, the iguanodon. Um, and what did I say about the iguanodon's feet? It has. A whole play. How many toes were on its back foot? Three, that's right. So a hoof and then three toes on its back foot. Good job. Do you see any dinosaur tracks here that look like they might have hoof and have three toes in the back? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's one really obvious one right here where it's got three toes and a hoof in front of it, another one above it, and another one. And in fact, you can follow these all the way up this hillside here in this diagonal direction. So that's what was walking through here was a big old guanodon. Now there's a set of dinosaur tracks just below it that also have three toes. Look how similar they look to our one and on tracks, so just a little bit smaller. It doesn't have a hoof, but if you had to guess what type of dinosaur made these, what would you guess? I'm going to guess a stegosaurus. That's a good guess, but it's not quite a stegosaurus. Again, look how similar they look to our guanodon tracks. That's the biggest clue. Iguana. It's an iguana. Yeah, a small iguanodon, a baby iguanodon made them. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? That's a behavior that we can observe about dinosaurs. Because a lot of people don't consider that they have this soft, nurturing side to them. They just think that they battled each other all day. <laughs> Which they did. I mean, that happens in Mother Nature all the time, right? But dinosaurs also had this gentler parenting side. They were moms and dads. Which is a really cool observation we can make about them directly from the footprints that they leave behind here. Um, this is also a behavior that sets them apart from reptiles, right? Because reptiles lay eggs on the beach, but they abandon their babies. They don't raise their young. But dinosaurs, even though they do lay eggs, they actually raise their babies. So that's a really good behavior that we can separate those two out from. Now, the other thing specific about iguanodon behavior that we can observe from these tracks, um, like you said, there's no hoof marks in front of them. 
So we think that baby iguanodons actually walked upright on two legs just like us. It wasn't until they got bigger and heavier that they just kind of toppled over on all fours. Now we have a third set of footprints down here, which I think he pointed out. And um, they also have three toes, but notice that their toes are a little bit longer, skinnier, and more spread out. What do these tracks remind you of? Yeah, so she said birds, which is exactly right. Um, they don't come from like a pterodactyl or anything like that. They actually come from a dinosaur called Ornithomimus which is very appropriately named because ornitho means bird, like ornithology is the study of birds. And mimic sounds like mimic. So we quite literally have a bird mimic dinosaur coming through here. And he's named that way because he has bird mimic footprints. Now, the ornitho mimus kind of looked like the ostrich of your nightmares. He had crazy feathers. He was ginormous. He had a long tail and most importantly, those sharp teeth, which you would not want to encounter on this beach 100 million years ago. Now the other thing about all these tracks here is we see that we have um, different species of dinosaurs living together and we actually have an entire ecosystem at work here. Why is there that big circle? Yeah, I'll talk about that in just a second. Is that a brontosaurus footprint? It's not a brontosaurus footprint. So we have all these dinosaurs living together in one unified system. So not unlike modern ecosystems where you have a lot of animals living together in one area interacting with each other the dinosaurs had the same sort of thing working for them as well uh, we have parental relationships we have relationships where large dinosaurs use smaller dino or where smaller dinosaurs use larger dinosaurs for protection we have ornithomimus through here which is the scavenger in our environment which means that he keeps everything clean he eats all the dead things um, and then we have our top predator, which is our crocodiles, um, which are over here. So the crocodile tracks are not painted in like our dinosaur tracks are. But above this big hole here, you can see a sign that says crocodile swim tracks. And slightly over to the right and down to the left, looks like something scooped the rock out. So those are our crocodile swim tracks, and they're the apex predator in this environment. They're the animal that's eating everybody else. Um, and keep in mind, in the early Cretaceous, crocodiles were three times bigger than modern day crocodiles. The little guys were about 12 feet long, mm -hmm. but they found crocodiles in the rock record almost as long as this bench. So that's part of why they were able to take down dinosaurs is because they were as big as a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing about these tracks is that we actually know they're older than our dinosaur tracks. This is because in geology, the oldest rock layers are deposited first and on the bottom, and the newer rock layers are deposited secondly on top of them. Because this rock layer sits below our dinosaur tracks, it means it had to have been deposited or laid down first. Um, and then our dinosaurs came in later and walked over the top of them on a totally different layer. Now we don't know exactly how much older these crocodile tracks are. It's likely it's just the difference between sea levels and seasons. Because um, our seawater had to have been high enough for a crocodile to come swim through here. That seawater later receded or drained out and our beach was formed for our dinosaurs to walk on. Now again, that could have been in the time frame of a few weeks. It could have been a year. It could have been a couple years, 10 years, 100 years. We don't know for sure because there's not the right materials in this rock to give us an exact age. And then kind of going back to his question about that hole right there. Um, so that is actually where a baby iguanodon track used to be. And in the 1950s, someone came up here and actually stole it from us. Yeah. Um, so it's a site of vandalism. However, it does have a happy ending. We did get that track back. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go over the entire story, but it is in our exhibit hall and the docent in there, can I explain that to you? Or there's like a little plaque right next to it that goes over its entire journey. Okay. Um, so yeah, if I had more time, I'd go over it, but unfortunately Well, there's a circle above it too. Like that's this yeah, one? So that's another site of vandalism. There's a lot of dinosaur track there, so I don't know why they're trying to take that chunk out. 
Maybe they were practicing for when they got the real one. I don't know. But there's another one. There's a dinosaur track way up there that has a circle around it. And then there's one down here at the bottom. So those are all places um, that we consider to be sites of vandalism for us, where people try to steal things. Any other questions? So they walked like uphill, like sideways? Um, they did not. During the like flat? Yeah, during the time that they were walking through here, it was actually all flat. Um, I will talk a little bit about that process a little bit later on in the tour, but in the meantime, I'll let you think about geologic processes that cause things like this to happen. It's fascinating. It's like the actual dinosaur footprints are showing dinosaurs. It's very amazing. Is that part of what's on the floor over there? Yes. I'm sure that Um, The biggest thing that we learned here at this site is uh, we see a lot of species interacting together here. This is what this site is evidence of. Um, an entire ancient ecosystem on your butt. working here. On your butt. Now, one of the predators of the Cretaceous that I haven't talked about is the Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and we actually don't have any T-Rex footprints up here or bones. But down there where all those houses are, uh, they do find T-Rex. But remember, that's all supposed to be underwater. So why would the T-Rex be down there, but not up here? Eating for fish or That's a good guess, but not drown? quite. Uh, T-Rexes couldn't swim very well. Yeah, they drowned a bit. Yeah. They were lacking quite a bit of buoyancy. Any other guesses? They couldn't use their small arms to swim. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's more okay, dangerous. so it's actually because there's a little bit of a time difference between our iguanodon and our T-Rexes. Um, there's actually a 36 million year time difference between when our iguanodons walked on the beach and when T-Rex makes his appearance into the world. Um, there's actually less time between us and the T-Rex than there is between the T-Rex and the majority of dinosaurs that lived on this planet, which gives you an idea of how vast dinosaur time is. And it was only around for about five to six million years before dinosaurs became extinct. Uh, the other dinosaur they tend to find down there in Denver is the Triceratops. Um, and if you're a sports fan, our Colorado Rockies baseball team has a Triceratops dinosaur as their team mascot. And this is because when they were building Coors Field, they found a few Triceratops bones. So to tribute that, they just decided to make it the team mascot. So if you're ever able to enjoy a sports game in the future and you go to a Rockies game and you wonder why we have a dinosaur running around on our end, that <laughs> is why. Um, and then kind of going back to uh, your question of if they walk up the hill or not, I was explaining that it was all flat. Um, and so what geologic processes that you know of could have affected our mountains? Yeah. Erosion. Erosion? Erosion is one. There's another really big one. Anyone know it? So it's a process called plate tectonics, which you might have learned about in school. Way back when. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah, it takes you back, right? Yep. Um, but I'll explain it. To you. So basically, um, 80, 70 to 80 million years ago, we have an event called the Laramide Orogeny. Orogeny is just a fancy term geologists use to describe mountain building events. Um, and again, it's driven by plate tectonics. And so basically what we have is the North American plate and the Pacific plate, and they are coming together. So the North American plate is what Colorado and most of the United States on, sits on. So as these two plates are coming together, where they meet is known as the San Andreas Fault in California. Now most mountains form when two plates come together and there's enough uh, pressure between the two as they're colliding and it shoves everything upwards. This is how mountains like the Himalayas are formed as well as the Cascades and Sierra Nevadas in uh, California. But as you can see we're very very far from the coastline so something else has to be at play here, right? What's actually happening is that Pacific plate is sliding underneath or subducting underneath the North American plate. 
Now, as it's grinding against the North American plate, it shoves everything upwards, and that's the Sierra Nevadas. But as this plate continues to slide underneath the North American plate, it eventually comes to a deep point where there's a very deep, very old mass of rock um, kind of underneath where Death Valley is. So like the nevada utah border. And there's enough pressure down beneath the surface that it actually shoves everything in upwards and eastwards and it tends to crinkle the landscape above it. The crinkling of the landscape is our Rocky Mountains. So that's how they are formed. Now because these two plates are still colliding, uh, we know this because of all the earthquakes we get along the San Andreas. Um, it means that our mountains are still being affected by it. They aren't growing at any significant rate per year, like we're talking millimeters to centimeters. Um, but what it does do is it causes our mountain blocks to move up and down all the time. And so Colorado and the Rocky Mountains in general actually have movement in the mountain range on a daily basis. And every time these mountains move, it results in an earthquake. So we actually get hundreds of earthquakes a day here in Colorado, but we usually just don't feel them because they're so deep um, within the mountain range or they're magnitude three or less, which you just don't feel at the surface level. And this is gonna bring us to our next site. So as we head around the corner, you made in the rocks on this side of the ridge that you didn't see on the other side. What is this? Reddish. Oh, uh, black. Black. Any other colors? Yellow. Yellow. White. 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 Purple. Purple. That's a good one. Usually people don't guess that one. Yeah, so you can see that there's all sorts of different colors in this rock. This is a kind of what we describe as a rainbow rock. And anytime you have a big color change in rocks, you're usually changing rock formations, which is exactly what we did. But we also did a little bit more than that. We traveled back in time about 50 million years. So everything on this side of the ridge is Jurassic in age, um, officially making it 150 million years old. So welcome to the real Jurassic Park, guys. <laughs> um, we also have footprints on this side of the ridge, but you can already tell that they are even different than the other side. So our first set of footprints looked like this. This is the same as when you and I make our own little impressions um, as we're walking through mud, right? What happens is over time, mud, sand, silt, clay, all sorts of sediments come in and fill in our dinosaur tracks, which creates layers, uh, which is what you see here in the sandstone. At the first site, what happened is that top layer was blasted away, exposing the impressions. impressions. But here what's happening is the bottom layer is actually breaking off and we're uh. looking at the underside of a dinosaur footprint. And so this tends to throw people off. They think that these are the footprints, but really it's this whole thing. Okay. And so this is essentially what you're looking at here, with this being the bottom of the foot and this being somewhere near the front. front. And so this dinosaur took a step here, and then again here, 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 and then just kind of kept going that direction. Cool. Okay. Now, unfortunately, this guy did not leave an autograph in the sand for us to identify him <laughs> by. That was not a high priority 150 million years ago. So we're kind of just left to guess. Um, the stride or the distance between one step to the other kind of gives us a clue. Yeah, so we are able to determine the height of this animal. Uh, we are also able to determine that it was a dinosaur that walked upright on two legs. Um, and of course it had to be been a dinosaur big enough to make these deep of impressions. So that kind of narrows it down a little bit. So we think it's a dinosaur called the Camptosaurus, um, which is an ancestor to the Hadrosaur dinosaurs or the duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, so something like the Iguanodon's great-great-grandmother walking through here, if that's yeah. what you wanted to picture. So we do have another set of dinosaur footprints here. 
Um, and now that you know how to identify them, see if you can find the second set. There. That one? Yeah. So there's one right here. Notice how much bigger it is compared yeah. to the other one. And if you follow these rock layers, you'll notice that they're all flat and horizontal until about here and they dip down again and create kind of a U shape. So that is another footprint from the same dinosaur that made this big di or this big footprint right here. Now we do know the name of this dinosaur. The dinosaur that made this footprint is called an Apatosaurus. Oh. Um, you've most commonly seen this dinosaur in movies like Jurassic Park. Um, Littlefoot from Land Before Time is an Apatosaurus, as well as Dino from the Flintstones. And to give you an idea of how big Dino would have been in real life, his head would have been where that dirt pile is, his tail would have touched this side, and his back would have been with this first row of bushes, but that's like a larger scraggly bush way up there. Um, so he was a big dinosaur, but he wasn't the biggest of the long necks, kind of in the middle there. Um, but nonetheless, um, so yeah, so that's who is making this footprint. And then the last thing I'll show you is actually over here. So here you can actually see both sets of footprints. Here's our Apatosaurus tracks, and these are our Camptosaurus tracks. Now, geologists and paleontologists are able to age date things in one of two ways. The first way is known as relative age dating, which is saying that this fossil sits in some relative direction to another one. For example, these Apatosaurus tracks sit below the Camptosaurus tracks, which means they're what? Older or younger? Older. Older, right? And so, um, that's relative age dating. That's all there is to it. Is that another layer of rock? Mm -hmm, another layer of rock formed above it. And that's when our Camptosaurus came through. I'd say about 80% of our rock record or our fossil record is relatively age dated with very few knowns in between. Um, how you get what is known as an absolute age is if something like a volcanic eruption occurs and places volcanic ash between these two sets of dinosaur footprints. That volcanic ash has things in it like uranium and thorium, which are radioactive isotopes that have uh, half-lives, right? And we have each of those radioactive isotopes has a known half-life. It's a set number. And we insert those numbers into mathematical equations and it outputs the date of which that was laid down. Okay. So that would be an exact age date. Um, and that's the other way we are able to age date fossils and stuff. It doesn't happen very often. It's pretty rare, but when it does, uh, we like it. In geology, just because you see really thick rock layers doesn't necessarily mean that that's millions of Maybe. years worth of time. What this does tell us is th about the environment, because uh, we can look at this rock at both um, a microscopic level and a large scale level. And this tells us that there were ancient river channels coming through here. And these ancient rivers tell us that these really thick rock layers are times when the rivers were flooding. And the really thin rock layers are times when the rivers were in drought. in drought. So again, rock layers generally, unless they have isotopes in them, they, they don't. don't tell us anything about age, but more about the environment that this was deposited in. Okay. Any questions about anything regarding that? No. And what are these different colors? The different colors are just different minerals that were in the rivers and streams that were deposited okay. uh, within the rock. I can't remember what each color, which mineral correlates to each color. I think magnesium is like the purple, but okay, you might have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember if it's manganese or magnesium. They're like interchangeable in my brain. Any other questions? Awesome. So we'll head on down to our last site, which is just down there where those blue rails are. If you guys want to walk down there, you're more than welcome to. Uh, there is a footprint about halfway down from a Jurassic carnivore. Otherwise, I'll be taking the bus and you're more than welcome to hop on the bus with me. What are you going to do? Walk? Perfect. Uh, down there? Yep, so just hear those blue rails and that dead tree. Okay, yeah. yeah. Huh? It's not a dinosaur, thank you, Scott. 
मुंह इधर आता था और टेल उधर नहीं टेल इधर थे और और उसका बैक उधर था बैक उधर था और बड़ा सा मुंह उस एच कॉर्नर पे पानी था ना पहले यार स्विमिंग करते थे स्विमिंग भी क्या ही करते होंगे पानी पे चलते होंगे है ना हाँ पता इतने बड़े थे इतने बड़े थे मैं सोचूं घर जाके जोरेसिक वर्ल्ड देखूं <laughs> आज की मूवी जोरेसिक वर्ल्ड हाथ गलने लगे ना पकड़ पहले तू ग्लव पहनने फिर पकड़ ले ठंडी वापस स्टार्ट हो गई ठंडी बढ़ गई है हाँ ग्लव्स पहन ली अभी टेम्परेचर जीरो के नीचे जा रहा है शायद हाँ नेक्स्ट सो दिस इज अवर डायनासोर बम बेड All of the rock behind me, including up where our Patasaurus tracks, is all part of the Morrison Formation, which is named for the town of Morrison just down the road from us. It actually extends all the way up into Canada and as far south as Mexico, so it's quite vast. And it's most famously known for its dinosaur bones. Now, to understand how the bones got here, again, we have to understand the environment that they were uh, deposited in. So again, this rock was telling us that there was a lot of ancient rivers and streams coming through Colorado during this time. If you want to picture something like the Mississippi Delta, where we have a lot of braided rivers and streams coming through here, that's exactly what it looked like. Now, if the dinosaurs died next to the river and the water was moving very, very quickly, those bones would oftentimes be streamlined and scattered all the way down the river channel, and it would hit rocks on the bottom of the river along the way, which would break them up and break them apart. That is until the river comes to a bend and then the bones are deposited in this river bend which is known as the point bar. So when we look at our dinosaur bones here this could actually be several different pieces of several different dinosaurs. Now sometimes if the water is moving very very slowly sand and sediment from the bottom of that river would just gently blanket up that dinosaur and that would be how you would get an almost entire specimen. It's very rare to find an entire set of dinosaur bones um, because even if uh, sand and sediment is just gently blanketing that dinosaur, things like scavengers and other things come along and pick apart that dead dinosaur and scatter their bones. Sometimes if they're really little animals, the wind will come in and blow the bones away. So that's why we usually never find 100% of a dinosaur. Oh. Um, the other thing about these bones is you'll notice that they're a much deeper red, almost black color compared to the surrounding rock. This is because there's iron in these bones, which comes from the dinosaur's blood when they were alive. Um, and when iron comes in contact with the air, oxygen, it rusts, it oxidizes. So that's what happen is happening. This reddish color is literally just the bones rusting. Um, they're also kind of smoother. They have a lot different texture than the surrounding rock. The rock is very sandpapery and very gritty and rough, but the bones themselves are very soft and very smooth. This is because they've undergone a process called remineralization, which means all of the bone marrow has been replaced with silica. Silica is the same thing that quartz is made up of. They're also kind of shiny because over the years, people have touched them and the oils from our fingers sheen them up quite a bit. But this is an interactive museum, so if you would like to touch the dinosaur bones, you're more than welcome to. 
Um, the one museum, we won't arrest you for it. <laughs> Just keep in mind, we don't sanitize them. Um, but if you are concerned, I do have hand sanitizer on the bus for you to use afterwards. And then lastly, the types of bones in here belong to dinosaurs called the Apatosaurus, which we already talked about. Other long neck dinosaurs like Diplodocus or Diplodocus, Camarasaurus. Uh, the Jurassic is mostly known for having long neck dinosaurs. There's very few predators running around. The largest. There was a what? Yeah, Brontosaurus. The uh, largest predator we have running through Colorado during this time is called the Allosaurus. And the Allosaurus is the great, 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 great granddaddy to the T Rex. He's a lot smaller than T-Rex. His bite strength is about the same as a lion's. For reference, T-Rex's bite strength is about seven tons. So that gives you a big size difference. And then the last dinosaur we find in here is of course the Stegosaurus. This is actually where we found that very first Stegosaurus in the world was this same bone bed. Uh, is there any questions about anything? No. Awesome, well I'll go ahead and let you guys check the bones out for a little bit. My bones. Ah. Oh. Ah. Right, so if you're so yeah, real are bone head dinosaur. Oh my god. This is the real bone. It actually looks like a spine. Yes, a bee structure. Kesa laga real bone touch karke. <laughs> part of your entire backbone. It goes all the way up to your neck and all the way down to here. So that's a vertebra. I don't know who it's from. Um, over here there's another big old bone. This is also a vertebra. It looks a little bit different because we're looking at it from the side instead okay. of down onto it like a bird's eye view. It also looks kind of funny because it comes from a Camarasaurus, so a long neck dinosaur. Yay! And long neck dinosaurs had very specialized vertebra to keep their heads upright all day because otherwise they'd just be face planting in the ground all the time. And then this bone that he found over here, and this rock, this big old bone, it goes from here to here. Is it five bone? Close. It's actually the ischium of an apatosaurus. And your ischium is where your tailbone connects to your hip bone. Okay. And humans, it's two separate bones and it's what makes us able to hula hoop. Um, in our long neck dinosaurs, they also had two separate bones. So theoretically, they would have been able to hula hoop. However, <laughs> in most dinosaurs, it's actually fused together in one single bone. Um, so like T-Rex would not have been able to hula hoop because you only have one bone. The only other animals we see this fusion in are birds, which is why we think birds are the ancestors of dinosaurs rather than reptiles. Oh. This bone down here. That is a big bone. I don't know what that one is. It could be a thigh. This is the real bone of yeah. a dinosaur. Yep, that's a real bone. But then the last bones we'll show you are down here and they're actually dinosaur teeth. Oh, dinosaur teeth. So these are our dinosaur teeth. And to kind of help break this down, so this is the root, this is the root, and this is the tooth that's exposed outside of the gum. Now notice that they're round. What do yeah. what does round teeth indicate? The herbivore. That it was an herbivore, right? That it ate plants. If you have sharp teeth, what do you eat? Meat. Meat. Yeah. And if you have a combination of? Both exactly right. So we can tell a lot about a dinosaur's diet just based on what type of teeth it has. So these come from Camarasauruses. So this tells us that Camarasauruses ate plants. They were herbivores. So those are dinosaur teeth. Are there any other questions about anything? Yeah, if you want some. All right, so kind of going back to the bones. So because of how they're deposited, uh, they are not sitting in the same spot that this dinosaur or these dinosaurs died in. So these bones have actually tell us a lot about how these dinosaurs died. Um, the bones themselves do tell us a lot about uh, dinosaurs and a little bit how they lived. Our science is getting so good to the point that we've been able to actually observe or identify growth patterns in dinosaurs. We know that our sauropods or our long neck dinosaurs grew very, very slowly, whereas things like the T-Rex and our theropods grew very, very quickly. 
Um, and we can uh, decipher that just based on their bones alone. We can actually identify certain diseases that certain species of dinosaurs may have had, um, or dinosaurs in general. What is this raptor thing up here? Um, it's a raptor track. It's really hard to find, so we usually don't point it out. Um, it's also brand new, but it's the one of the very few raptor tracks that we've ever found. It's one of the ancestors to like some raptor that they find in Asia. It's not a velociraptor though. Um, anyways, so the dinosaur bones, we've even been able to extract dinosaur DNA at this point. Um, they've been experimenting with T-Rex bones, so that's, they've actually been able to extract a little bit of T-Rex DNA. But the hope is that later on, eventually we'll have enough of it to sequence an entire uh, genome and an entire DNA sequence for these dinosaurs. And not just T-Rex, also things like Triceratops and Stegosaurus and Apatosaurus, which would be pretty cool. The visitor center. I hope you guys enjoyed your tour today. Um, I know you guys learned some new things because you told me. Um, but I hope that you guys are able to make it back here in the future um, and refer people to us. If you haven't already, please check out our exhibit hall. It's a really great animation to what we just talked about up on the ridge. Um, and also go ahead and visit our gift shop if you haven't already done so either. With that, are there any last minute comments, questions, concerns? No. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. You. All right. Have a great rest of your day, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Have safe travels. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Huh? So guys, our 40 minutes ki ye tour to khatam ho gaya hai, and I have to apni life mein aisa first time kuch dekha hai ki hum actual dinosaur ke footprints dek pa rahe hai, and unke bones touch kar pa rahe hai. तो मुझे तो बहुत ही ज़्यादा फैसिनेटिंग लगा एंड ये जो टूर था हमने उसको एक एक मिनट का कवर किया है तो आप पूरा एक वीडियो में देख सकते हो कि क्या क्या हमने सीखा आज एंड क्या क्या देखा एंड इतनी सारी चीज़ें मुझे पता चली आज जो मैं कभी सोच भी नहीं सकती थी तो अगर मैं थोड़ा समराइज़ करके आपको बताऊँ तो उन्होंने बताया कि ये जो जगह कोलोराडो में हम रहते हैं जो कि माउंटेन्स है बेसिकली वो हंड्रेड मिलियन ईयर एगो यहाँ पे सी बीच था मतलब यहाँ पे एक्चुअल सी था बट ये पूरा चेंज होके अब एक माउंटेन बन गया है तो वो काफ़ी फैसिनेटिंग लगा उसके अलावा हमने डायनासोर के फ्रीवेज देखे फ्रीवेज मतलब जहाँ पे वो वॉक करते थे तो पूरा उनके फुटप्रिंट्स उनके बेबीज़ के फुटप्रिंट्स दिखे एंड फिर हम लोग और आगे गए तो हमें अलग अलग टाइप के डायनासोर के बोन्स दिखे तो उससे ये पता चलता है कि बहुत सारे स्पीशीज़ के डायनासोर्स थे एंड वो लोग साथ में एक पूरे हैबिटाट में रहते थे तो बहुत ही अमेजिंग लगा एंड क्रोकोडाइल्स के मार्क्स थे तो वो उनके प्रेडेटर्स थे मतलब इतने बड़े क्रोकोडाइल्स थे कि वो डायनासोर को हंट करते थे तो मुझे तो बहुत ही अमेजिंग लगा एंड आप लोग मुझे बताओ कमेंट सेक्शन में कि आपको कौन सा वाला पार्ट या कौन सी वाली चीज़ जान के सबसे अमेजिंग लगा तो मुझे कमेंट सेक्शन में ज़रूर बताओ एंड मैं तो आने वाले फ्यूचर में भी अपने सारे फ्रेंड्स के साथ फैमिली के साथ यहाँ पे वापस आने वाली हूँ क्योंकि मुझे तो बहुत ही सही लगा ये एंड यहाँ पर एक एग्जिबिट सेंटर भी है तो हम लोग अभी वहाँ जाने वाले हैं क्योंकि वहाँ भी बहुत सारे कुछ कुछ फॉसिल्स होंगे जो उन्होंने रखे होंगे तो लेट्स सी देखते हैं ओके यू कैन गो हेड एंड कीप दैट व्हेयर यू गाइस फ्रॉम डेनवर ओके So the way that it goes around is it goes this way around the exhibit and align up with the footprints and the time periods. And okay. okay. Thank you. Uh huh. And you can take pictures if you want. Just okay. Just so you know. Thank you. Yep. Diplosaurus skull.
कुछ बोल सकती है और कोई नहीं ये 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 स्काई रियल है ऐसा था नॉर्थ अमेरिका Doug Bill Edmontosaurus ऐसे no. फुटप्रिंट्स हमने देखे ना वहां पर हाँ सेम तीन ये देख पीछे घास खा रहे हैं ये क्या है वॉम्स क्लैम्स श्रिम्स एंड अदर इनवर्टिब्रेट्स मेड दीज बम्स एंड बरोज व्हिच आर कॉल्ड द ट्रेस फॉसिल एक्टिविटीज ऑफ ऑर्गेनिजम्स पहले पहले अर्थ पे सिर्फ ये रहते थे ना हां बस देखो बीच में घूम रहे हैं ये हो गया हंड्रेड एंड फाइव मिलियन ईयर्स अब पहले पहले वैसा था पानी नहीं सबसे पहले हाँ पानी में ही घूमते थे लोग हाँ फिर थोड़ा पानी फिर ऐसा बीच बनने लगा फिर यहाँ पे और क्रोकोडाइल्स क्रोकोडाइल्स आ गए नाइन्टी टू पूरा पानी है कोलोराडो नहीं ये पूरा वो है हाँ हाँ ये क्या है रिटर्न ट्रैक ये जो चोरी हो गया था हाँ एक कोई लेके जा रहा था फुटप्रिंट रॉक से काट के लोग चुरा कर लेके जा रहे थे ये फुटप्रिंट और ये टू थाउजेंड सेवन में वापस मिल गया ये ऐसे होते हैं तीन लोग टच करेंगे तो कोविड कोविड ये बोन्स हैं शायद उनके ये सिक्सटी एट मिलियंस ईयर अब ये भाई साहब कौन है ये देख हाँ ये एक बोन है नेक है लॉन्ग नेक डिप्लो स्कल
डू नॉट टच ये सब के टकले हाँ 